Justin, it's lovely to see you. Nice to see you smiling today. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. How are you? you? You've taught me that bit, Maria, about projecting a bit more smiley on camera. Yeah, I like to see you smile. It's great. It's wonderful because you're a very you're a happy, jolly person, really. But we need, you keep it inside sometimes. So anyway, listen, I'd love to talk to you about your career. You sort of seem to have had 15 different careers in, in your my, my, I suppose a few of us have. But yours are interesting because you started at McDonald's. You've got to tell me the story. How did you go to, from McDonald's to sort of, you know, being a, a highly in demand expert on high performance? Um, so you have done your research. The McDonald's bit doesn't come up very often these days. Um, yeah, so that was straight out of school. But uh, what I actually did then, my sort of first proper job out of school was uh, I did a year in the army, uh, which was quite a learning experience more than I realized at the time, probably. Uh, but I saw these while well, I was working really hard doing army stuff, I saw these people flying over in these cool planes, and thought that looks more fun. Uh, so after university, I joined the Air Force did about six years on the front line flying a jet called the tornado, tornado F3 which is now in a museum, which is quite sobering for me. I saw one in the RAF museum and I was like, oh, this is cool, I've flown this jet. And then there was a bit of a realization of the jet I flew is in a museum. Uh, and for my last three years on the Red Arrows, uh, sorry, my last three years in the Air Force, I was on the Red Arrows. Uh, so I did about 250 displays and I was the executive officer and the team leader there. And then left the Air Force and set up this business mission excellence not really because I had any brilliant sort of strategy or vision or exit in mind or all the things they teach you at business school, uh, more that I didn't know what I wanted to do. The, the normal route for people from my background would have been the airlines. Um, I didn't fancy that. And so I looked at other ways to leverage my skill set, set up this business, doing some work about building high performance teams. And that's still part of my activity. You know, over time, the breadth and depth of that has grown. So now I'm doing personal advisory work. You know, I'm a coach to a, a senior leadership team. Uh, I've done some work with the United Nations uh, with Mercedes F1, uh, and then still have the programs, the sort of leadership development, uh, more program type work running through Mission Excellence. And then most recently, I actually did a corporate job. So I had a consulting placement for three months at L3 Harris, where they then asked me to stay and extend that. And I went on the payroll for a bit which was actually a, a good experience in the context of this conversation, because I think, you know, if you're doing speaking, it's quite easy to stand on stage and say, you know, it's not rocket science, you know, you just do A, B and C, which is broadly true, except when you're actually in the thick of it, A, B and C aren't so easy anymore. So I ended up owning a significant P&L with a global responsibility in a business that reported quarterly, it was subject to a lot of short term pressures, politics, conflicting priorities, you know, all the stuff that people probably deal with all the time. And yeah, I, I kind of got the other side of it a bit that when I'm standing on stage that people are facing uh, a few more challenges than than speakers might sometimes give them credit for. I think that's really good. I really like that. I also made a note about the fact that, you know, your tornado is in a museum. That makes me smile as well, because we're, we're not getting any younger, are we? Let's be honest. But no, I do love the fact that you actually went into the corporate and experienced it from the other side. I think that's that must have been quite sobering and also gives you a, a different uh, depth and breadth to understanding. But what I also love about you is the fact that uh, there are people who talk about high performance who've never actually been part of a high performing team or who've never even led a high performing team. And you You've sort of been in the thick of it and done it and you've also worked now in a corporate as well do you think that gives you some advantage do you think that has helped you well clearly i'm going to say yes to that obviously <laughs> uh, however i do think it's a yes but you know there has to be some context here a lot of people who are say in academia or some of the sort of thought thought leader or public intellectual would argue that the having not having skin in the game gives you the independence and objectivity and space uh, from the issue to take you know a truly objective view of it which i'd wholly agree with that but my caveat is that if you're talking about sort of performance issues and human issues and performance under pressure and leadership these are not academic subjects they're practices and unless you've practiced them you might get the theory, but it's quite difficult to understand the, the real pressure and how it really works in practice. Uh, I think leadership's a great example here that if you ask people what makes a great leader, you will get a broadly consistent set of answers and it'll all be a sort of positive set of values. Uh, and you can get that from very diverse audiences and they'll give you broadly similar things. 
but organizations still struggle with leadership in a really big way and i think you know the, the challenge is that it's more difficult than the theory uh, and so yeah i think that's i would like to think that having had skin in the game that gives me an understanding of the actual issues but now having a bit of distance from it i hope that i can also look at it objectively so you know I'm kind of blowing my own trumpet, I guess, then. I've got the best of both worlds. But I, to answer your question, I think the in performance of human issues, um, you, you need to have kind of experienced it, really. Yeah, I, I think it's an advantage, personally. I think, and, and also, you know, you can speak to, about it from a different point of view. So it gives a different, you know, a, a different uh, feel to the, to the content as well. Um, the Red Arrows, I think sometimes you might underestimate how interested we all are in the Red Arrows, because we all also at different times, certainly in the UK, will have looked to the skies and seen these amazing displays. And we all want to know more about it. And uh, uh, what would you say you've learned from that, that you're apply to your to your clients about high performance so that's an interesting observation about you know what other people think of it is that i think i thought the same as you even when i was in the air force and then you get into that team and on day one it's like oh my god this is amazing and you know you're, you're excited and challenged and everything but of course like everything it does become your job um, and you you know that it's a great job to have, but you sort of lose that perspective a little bit that somebody else, how other people see it. And you're probably right that it's quite difficult for me to see it through somebody else's lens. Um, it definitely has influenced me though. I, I think there's there's probably two angles here. One is the thing that other people generally latch onto, which I'll explain to you. And then there's also what I personally took from it. And the thing that I found that people consistently latch onto is the concept of the team rotation. So on the Red Arrows, you have about 100 people on the team. Uh, the front end of that, if you like, is the nine display pilots. And each year of the nine display pilots, the three most experienced, experienced pilots leave. So just think about that. Imagine losing the most experienced third of your workforce every year. You know, it's madness. Only the military could think of this. <laughs> and clearly there are some good reasons for it to do with career progression, bringing fresh blood in. And there are some operational reasons why it actually works quite well. But I think what is interesting to other people, and certainly in the corporate world, is that the, the team's output, the display, the performance, is pretty consistent year on year, even though it's different people. It doesn't depend on one or two stars. You know, contrary to what my mum had told all her friends, it wasn't just that I was the best fighter pilot since Tom Cruise. Um, slightly to my disappointment, the team carried on producing the same results without me. And it's almost like they've bottled it. There's something in the culture, the behavior, the process, the how we do business around here that's reproducible, that doesn't depend on individuals. And that's broadly true, to be honest, of the military. The Red Arrow is just a very sort of nice niche version of that. And so I think that's influenced my thinking a lot. I think that when it comes to a lot of sort of transformation, performance issues, those three factors, the sort of culture or the environment set by the leadership, people's attitude within the organization and the processes you have, if you can get them right and deeply embedded, you've got something there that you can systemize uh, and you, know, you can put other people into that machine. So I think that was my sort of the learning that I know other people seem to, to find interesting. For me personally, and I've had time to reflect on, on this experience and people have asked me, what was your best job? And kind of obviously it was, it was the Red Arrows. Uh, and there's a superficial bit to that, that it's just great and you, you're excited to do it. But I've sort of reflected on what was it that made it good? Because it's not consistently good yet. It's very hard work. It's demanding. The training is quite stressful. And I think it boils down to a couple of things that every day when you go to work, you have a stretch experience. Um, you never really just have a kind of, you know, bunch of meetings that nobody's really engaged in. You might have some of those even there. But then you go flying in the middle of this, you know, you fly two or three times in the winter when you're training two or three times every day. And even by your third year, it's still a stretch experience. You still have to have your wits about you. And that's quite a rewarding way to work. Now, I was talking about it to um, Sean Wayne recently, the, the British rugby league coach. And he was sort of saying that the Red Arrows was, you know, much more than people did in rugby that you know we just play a game of rugby whereas you're doing this super dangerous thing and you know you've really got to commit and i didn't really agree with him because we don't really have to commit in terms of physical courage like they do you know they they put themselves on the line uh, and they really do uh, have to stand up and be counted for their teammates 
And there's none of that physical courage in this. And I was kind of like, no, you're underestimating it. You know, what you do is harder. <laughs> We're in a bit of a mutual loving. Um, but having thought about it, you know, even while I was talking to him, I realized that you, you do have to commit. It's in a different way, rather than a physical thing of not letting people down, it's a not letting people down in performance under pressure. You have to get most of your decisions about right. You have to be competent, really know your stuff, and you have to perform under pressure. So that stretch experience is, is half of the, the personal story for me. And the other bit is the feedback. Every time we fly, we have this stretch experience, and then we debrief. Now, the debrief's not always loads of fun. You know, if you're in your first year, you feel like you're never going to be good enough. Um, and so by the very nature of it, the people in the first year are getting a bit more feedback in terms of things to work on. But I came to realize that that's a, that combination is very powerful to give people stretch experiences, which, you know, at some level they will probably enjoy, um, and then to give them instant feedback so that, you know, continual improvement becomes a reality. So sorry, that was quite a long answer, but I think there's this bit about the system, the environment, the attitudes, the, the, the processes that make it reproducible. And then I think it's very rewarding for people individually because of this stretch experience and the, the continuous feedback loop. No, it was an excellent answer. Absolutely excellent. I've made a pile of notes here. So let's see if I can go back and just unpick some of the stuff you said. A really excellent answer. So the first thing, I mean, the whole red arrows thing, I'm even really more excited about it now. Now you've explained it. What an incredible thought that every year you lose your top three performance. So I, when I was running my speaker bureau, I had 10 people on my team. If I was losing my top three performance every year, I think I, I, I don't know what I would do. I don't think I'd get out of bed in the morning. But what a great exercise to do with a team when you're training them and teaching them to say, imagine this is what you'd have to do. What systems would you put in place? I absolutely love that as a learning exercise. And I love the idea of a stretch experience every day. Uh, really love that. But also the point you were making about, um, you know, so, sort of the, the comparison against the rugby and it maybe not being quite as, as bad you're very visible up there if you're if there's nine of you up there and one of you is not as good you're incredibly visible you're very exposed your performance is really exposed um but let me ask you a few more questions here can, can i just latch on to one thing you said there actually maria about the one of you's not as good yeah but that's an interesting little rabbit warren i could easily dive down that I think one, sports teams and military teams are often held up as examples of high performance. And some of the analogies are relevant to other worlds and to the corporate world, and some of them less so. And what you've just touched on there is one that's a tricky issue, that in sports and the military, and in the military in particular, you're measured only by the collective performance. So when you say that one of you is not uh -huh. as good, nobody knows who that individual is, certainly from the ground. And ultimately, that the team is only measured by its collective performance. And so when it comes back to this thing about changing through a year, when you change through a year, it's not like the team is at this level and some other people come in at this level and they have to work their way up. The team reforms at this level and you all have to work your way back up. Wow. Um, I'll just say that I just wanted to sort of mildly challenge that point about, you know, it's not really about the one person who, who, who didn't perform. It's actually that is the standard of the team. And that's interesting because, as you say, that, that the team has to come back to that level so that you can all go up. That's, that's really fascinating because it's sort of it's maybe not be how, how you would think about it in business. I, I quite like that. I also love the point you make about feedback and debriefing. I think there's not enough. I mean, I, I don't know. Do you agree? I don't think there's not enough feedback um, mm. given in business. Um, and I don't know if you experienced that at all in your work in, in the corporate. Yeah, I think the people, I think you, got, I, 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 as you know, to some extent, uh, Maria, I can do pedantic. You need to separate <laughs> out feedback and debriefing a bit. Uh, you know, the, the feedback is almost the evidence, if you like. The, the debrief, whether on your own or in a team, is what you do with it, the analysis and what am I going to do differently. And yet it's not as common in other environments. Uh, and I think the one reason for that is simply that there's more risk in that world. Therefore, you've got, you know, personal skin in the game in, in understanding things that didn't go so well. The other is that um, it's, it's a bit of a sort of priorities issue. If you come up with a new process for something and it works and people see it works, they're bought in. They're, they'll pretty much do it straight away because it's an improvement. Whereas debriefing is a bit like leadership development. You know, it's not a turnkey solution. You will not see an instant response. You, it is like leadership that you just have to believe that this is something that is a driver of performance and we need to do it. 
And so I think, you know, it is easy to sideline it in, say, the corporate world because there are a million other priorities and get on to the next job. Um, and so it's just not as high a priority, I guess. Yeah, no, it makes total sense. OK, I have a question for you. It's a bit of a challenging one. Has the military background ever worked against you as a speaker? Uh, yes, to some extent, and, and for some consultancy work, um, because sometimes when you get an inquiry or an opportunity or something, people have preconceptions about the military. And that's not their fault. You know, I need to own that myself because they, they've just been exposed to whatever they've been exposed to. But you will come across against um, people's, people whose sort of frame of reference, and it's not that uncommon, is command and control. Um, you know, it's very male dominated, it's follow orders, it's not multicultural. Uh, and I say, I, I kind of need to own that myself. And of course, the reality is the military, all of those things have been true to, at some ex to some extent at some point, um, but they're not really reflective of the day to day environment. Certainly the command and control in particular, you know, I, I was working in a very sort of highly empowered environment. Um, and of course, I've also been out a long time. Uh, I, I've worked, you know, all over the world with people from different backgrounds and what have you. Um, but I, I can't do much about the fact that people do arrive with those preconceptions and say, I, I need to sort of own them. And ironically, diversity has actually become a bit of a thing for me now, not in necessarily in gender or cultural race or anything, but in performance um, with the, the lens of sort of cognitive diversity. And that's an area that I've done more and more work in because I started to realise that decision making in teams and under ambiguity is a key driver of performance. Um, and what you need to do to improve that is to leverage cognitive diversity. And I've done quite a lot of work with a, a guy at Imperial College here, Mark Bergman, who's brilliant on this stuff. Um, and of course, the, this current sort of momentum behind diversity issues can only be a positive in the long term. But that doesn't change who you've got on your team tomorrow. Um, and so you can't suddenly think, oh, well, I need a more diverse group and instantly change that. But what you can do is employ certain processes to leverage the cognitive diversity of the group you've got a lot more effectively to you know, reduce biases and make better decisions. So I've gone on a bit of a tangent there, I'm afraid. It seems to be my habit. But... And I, no, your tangents are, are very valid, actually, and, and it's a really important topic. So I'm glad you picked up on that. Um, Another really difficult question, because obviously the depth of knowledge you have about high performance, there's so many things that you can be talking about with regards to it. But if you had to choose one factor, what would you say is the most important driver of high performance? Can you put it down to one thing? Um, I don't think you can put it down to one thing, but I will answer your question directly. My own thinking on this has evolved over time. Uh, and my answer would be what I call a better understanding of reality that mitigating the biases, this sort of back to my previous thing about cognitive diversity, mitigating the biases that permeate our decision making and our ability to learn from things, you know, how we attribute causation after the event. And I think my journey on this stuff started in terms of looking back on the fighter pilot stuff. So fighter pilots are relatively good on average at making decisions in high pressure environments. I mean, I guess that's you know, self-evident from the nature of the job. But I'm not sure that they're that good by design. I think it's just an environment where you need to be. And so the skill set and the training has evolved over time to make that happen without anybody necessarily really designing it like that. And so in my years since, I've reflected on this a bit about, you know, how what, what are the factors that make it possible that fighter pilots generally make pretty good decisions and, you know, live to fight another day in these high pressure situations? And then that led me down a path of into more generally around decision making under ambiguity, because people think of the sort of pilot world as rules, regulations, you know, highly regulated. It kind of is, but it's still very fast moving. You know, it's not much like what you see on Top Gun or the news, um, you know, the flying on Top Gun, maybe a bit. I didn't get to play volleyball once. Um, it, but the, the, the reality of that world is it, it, the, the, the flying is just what it is. It becomes a skill that's 10% of the job. What you have to do is execute a task that is characterized by ambiguity, imperfect information, deadline pressure, consequences of decisions. So I reflected on these things quite a bit. And then I say it dragged me down this route of more generally around decision making under ambiguity. And what I realized there is that why that's difficult is because we have biases. If there is ambiguity, almost by definition, we have to apply judgment. 
We can't get there by logic alone. It's ambiguous. There's not enough information. And so we have to apply judgment to it. And we think we're good at this. And the older we get, the more experienced we get, the more we get wedded to our delusions of brilliance on it. But the reality is there's overwhelming evidence that actually we're terrible at it. Um, especially, you know, we all bring cognitive biases to the party. And then there are motivational biases from our boss, from the organization, you know, pressuring us to do things that we may or may not think is, is the, the, a good idea. And so we're, you know, a good example of this in practice is the debriefing we mentioned. Um, there's a great model in psychology that it, I think gives you an insight what's going on there called actor observer bias. And what it says is if you're an observer of something and you're external and you're neutral, you're pretty objective. It's the thing about having distance again. But if you're an actor in the middle of it, you tend to have a very subjective opinion, especially if it didn't go well. We tend to blame the situation, the organization, somebody else, you know, at least at first. Not many people run around going, yo, it's me, no bonuses this year, sorry, screwed up. Um, you know, organizations don't incentivize this. And what happens in high performance individuals and teams is an ability to bridge that gap, to bring external objectivity to internal performance. So that's just an example of one example for me of this better understanding of reality, trying to understand what actually happened as opposed to what we'd like to think happened or how we'd like to attribute the, the sort of cause and effect. And the, the, people have asked me a lot about, you know, how do you get people to be that honest? How do you have those conversations? The single simplest, biggest, quick win is to lead from the front. If you're the senior person and you're having some sort of review meeting, start by admitting what you got wrong first. It will transform the conversation for everybody else. But I'll, I'll throw that one out there, you know, if that's not what somebody normally does. Um, try it in a meeting, admit your own mistakes, you know, hold your hand up and see what happens. And write to me on LinkedIn and tell me what happened. I'd be really interested to, uh, you know, see if you're anybody on the team comments afterwards or it drives the conversation. That's really interesting. I like that. We'll have to we we'll put that out there as a challenge. I think definitely. I wrote down delusions of brilliance. I definitely suffer from that sometimes. Um, <laughs> and then delusions of inadequacy too, as well. Or I don't know, <laughs> reality. I actually expected you to say to me, um, you know, that the most important factor was your purpose. You know, sort of like what Simon Sinek might say is start with why. So I was a bit surprised mm. by that answer. So uh, Sinek's clearly very good, very high profile, and uh, people. Um, you know, put a lot of store by that, that, that uh, both that stuff and the other work he's done. Um, having said that, I don't agree with that theory. You know, it's been a multi-million pound bestseller. The, because I think it doesn't tell the whole story. It, it, is it important and good to have a sense of purpose in your work in an organization? Yes. But does it tell the story? You know, when I was flying, what was my motivation? The Red Arrows is a great example of this. What was my motivation? Now, the raison d'etre or mission is something about PR and a display it through a display of excellence, you know, public relations for the military. How much of a driver is public relations for the military for those pilots? Zero? I mean, I, I think what's happening here is something different where clearly they get it and they're, you know, they're broadly brought into that concept, concept, but the job is intrinsically motivating. Somebody's going to give me some amazing toys to play with and give me a stretch experience every day, and they're going to pay me for doing this. I don't really care what it's for. You know, I'm bought in anyway because it's just a really, it's a personally rewarding experience, irrespective of the purpose. And I think the big tech companies are sort of interesting here. You know, they, they haven't covered themselves with glory on purpose. I don't mean, it wasn't meant to be a double, on, double entendre of that. Um, but, you know, they haven't, on that issue of purpose, they haven't covered themselves with glory, yet they're still highly desirable companies to work for, because if you want to do cutting edge work with loads of resources, they, they will let you do that. Um, and even for the customer, you know, I know Simon Sinek makes the point about, you know, some of these, these companies have been so successful because customers like the fact they have, you know, really good purpose, and that's the key to their success. Is it? You know, I got something delivered on Amazon the other day, and then they a brilliant app, so they send you how many stops it's got to go. It was literally at the top of the road, and it has eight stops to get to me. They're delivering something there, which I think is driven, you know, why are customers buying into this? Utility comes the next day, super fast. Price, you know, they're pretty competitive, if not the best. What do we, re what's our view on 
Amazon's purpose or Jeff Bezos' purpose? Does anybody know? So I do think that, you know, Simon said it makes a very valid point that in purpose within an organization can be very powerful. But I think it's just too small a part of the story. You, it can't, it's not the whole story. It's a bit like the difference in microeconomics historically where, you know, it's supply and demand and we assume a rational customer. And then you get people like Daniel Kahneman and more recently, you know, uh, people who study behavioral economics who realize that customers are completely irrational and make you know, decisions that don't stand up to any of these assumptions. Well, I think that kind of applies here that the theory about purpose, totally get it. And actually, if you get it right in practice, very powerful. I'm just not sure it reflects reality. It's interesting you gave Amazon as an example, because when people talk to me about purpose, I give that as an example, too. So because uh, I, I use them as well. So we, we'll have to get some uh, commission here from Amazon um, anyway. Or maybe they're the new sponsor today. Who knows? So, so this a couple more questions for you before I before I let you go. Um, tell me, how have things changed over the last year? What are clients asking you for that is different? So the two big things in terms of content or focus uh, are very simple, decision making or ambiguity and building high performance virtual teams. So I think the clients companies have wrestled with ambiguity forever, but to a lesser degree for a lot of companies, whereas almost everybody's wrestling with it in the last year or so about not knowing what the future looks like, not knowing what the economy looks like, not knowing what the COVID rules are. So that's become a much bigger issue that I've ended up doing quite a lot of work on around the, the tools and approaches to make better decisions in ambiguous environments. And then the other one for again, for obvious reasons is high performance virtual teams. And one of the best insights I got here uh, quite early on in the pandemic or well, ish, you know, three, three, three to six month period in, um, I, I rang around a lot of clients and former clients and just said, how's this going? What's different for you? You know, what are you finding is working and not working? And uh, there was a guy at Microsoft who did give me permission to quote him, Angus Foreman, he's quite a senior exec there, who came out with a great little insight for me. Because I said to him, it can't be that different for you guys, you know, this is what you do, you know, it's great business for teams. Uh, plus, you've been running global, you know, virtual teams forever. And he said, yeah, that's true. However, we'd still got on a plane at the drop of a hat and go and have a meeting or go to a conference or something. And he said, the, and I, I'm going to struggle to do justice to his quote precisely, but it was along the lines of the, the things that drive high performance in the real world haven't changed here. What has changed is getting them right in the small window that we have to lean through as we work virtually. You know, this little window that you and I are looking at each other, looking through, at each other through now. And I thought that was really insightful. And I reflected on it quite a bit because one of the sort of mantras that I push is about clarity, alignment, empowerment. That you, and highly empowered teams are generally more effective. In order to do that, you have to have clarity in the common purpose, a real clarity, and you have to have alignment of efforts and processes and communication and stuff. And I think in in a face to face world, you can get away with not quite getting all those things right because you pick up the pieces in the random meetings or going out for a coffee or around the water cooler or going out for lunch or dinner or something, that you, you have a chance to fill the gaps or ask a colleague questions or ask your boss questions. But when you're working virtually to the extreme degree of individuals in their houses in front of a computer, they're on their own. And so I think this is, I thought he, he gave me a really interesting line of thinking and insight on this, that the clarity alignment stuff is still absolutely pivotal it was just easier to get away with it when you were all together. But if you're working virtually, it's much less forgiving of not getting those things right. And of course, there are other things around the, that was the process. Then we, you know, there are, there are things about people's attitude, which I think in this context probably boils down to resilience. So the things you can do, you know, that not, you don't, they're not particularly complicated or a big deal, but to help your resilience. And then there, there are leadership factors that the environment that senior people set up and the support networks they put in place uh, for people who are, you know, in a more challenging home working environment. So I've learned a lot myself around the virtual teams bit. In hindsight, it was kind of what we used to do in the military. You know, you sit in a cockpit on your own in this huge extended virtual team that might be multinational, but we'd still have meetings and, you know, briefs and debriefs and what have you. Whereas now we've taken this to an extreme. As I say, I think my sort of key point is that the, the things that, drive high performance haven't changed they're just harder mm. 
really insightful of, of your or your your colleague your client there at Microsoft and what a great idea to actually pick up the phone speak to your clients and ask them what's changed you know I encourage speakers to do that all the time well done for doing that good um so I mentioned in the introduction that you're doing something new you're taking on a, a new challenge um can you tell us a little bit about that Yes, so I've got a random uh, left field new challenge uh, arrived with me recently that a friend introduced me to a team of scientists who have developed a bacterium or developed the bacterium exists, but they've developed a way of using it uh, to, to fast forward to keep this pretty high level to replace fertilizer. So I was pretty much unaware that fertilizer, and you kind of knew instinctively, I guess, that fertilizer is pretty pivotal to the food chain. What I was unaware of is it's spectacularly bad for the environment uh, and becoming unsustainably so. Uh, but the, pop the global population is still growing. So these scientists, there are other sort of variations in this field, but they've come up with a very, very precise method of um, having the in, coating a seed of a plant with this bacterium, which then allows it to extract nitrogen from the air rather than from the environment, sorry, from the fertilizer. Um, which is transformational, you know, potentially saves farmers a ton of money, makes their lives easier, huge impact for the environment. And they're all very clever scientists and wanted somebody to, to run the company, uh, to do, do the commercial side of it. So, uh, yes, that's where I'm at. It's going to be a bit of a slow burn for me because we're, we're still in an R&D phase for about 18 months. So um, I have quite good availability still for speaking and stuff. Uh, but as that kicks in, you know, the, the, the potential for it is enormous. I think what motivated me boiled down to two things. One is it's a force for good. And I know, you know, we talked about, but ironically, me having sort of undermined the purpose argument a bit, <laughs> this has got a really strong purpose, which is part of what I bought into. Uh, and then also the, the potential scale of the opportunity is enormous, you know, the, the scale of the impact. So I'd say it's a slow burn for me, but really exciting and a new challenge for me as well. It's a high performance alternative to the traditional way of fertilizing. There you go. It all fits, doesn't it? It all fits everything. But listen, finally, 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 let me ask you one more question because you've been so generous with your time. Um, we're not getting any younger. I mentioned it earlier. You've been speaking for 15 years, I think, or more. What have you learned in that time as a speaker? I'll just maybe I've learned lots, hopefully, you know, you'd like to think you've got better. Let me let me focus on two things, one at the start of that time and one more recently. So at the start, I, I was running workshops, seminars, and I was doing some speaking. And what I found was that the, you know, I, I do practice some of what I preach. I'm pretty objective with myself. And I looked at the scores we were getting back in you know, a feedback tick sheets and that. And the speaking was getting a good scores, seven, eight, maybe the occasional nine, ten. Um, and the workshops were getting nines and tens. And I looked at this and I was thinking, well, it's, I was leading all of it at that time. You know, there are other people lead Mission X and stuff now, but I was leading, leading it. And I was thinking, it's broadly similar content. It's the same speaker. It's just in a workshop format. Um, why am I getting lower scores for the speaking? And I, I couldn't, you know, get to a perfect answer on this. But the thing I concluded was that speaking is very intolerant of any, you know, any anything that the speaker doesn't get quite right. In a workshop, people form an opinion of the content, the speaker, the interactivity, the exercises, the whole thing. And the thing they probably remember most is the last thing they did. Whereas as a speaker, there's nowhere to hide. It's just you. And so I thought maybe I'm not quite as good at the speaking as I think I am. Maybe I'm not a lot good at the speaking. So I hired a lady, Bridget Bryce. Uh, she's a retired actress, wonderful lady. And to do a bit of coaching for me, and I was kind of thinking that she's going to teach me the trick, you know, how to turn the key, how to be great at this stuff. And she didn't do that. She had me do all this sort of fluffy, woolly acting stuff. And if you ever see this, Bridget, sorry for saying that, but you know, the, you know that that's how I felt about it. But the thing that I got most from her was about being the moment, which sounds sort of obvious, but and it was a big learning point and I didn't get it straight away. You, you have to sort of think about it and you almost have to get to the stage where you, you are in the moment to get the point. The way she got to it was I sent her a video before. This is so embarrassing. Maria. I sent her a VHS. That's when I did this coaching. Um, I sent her a VHS and she looked at it that before I'd ever met her. And we went and had a meeting and she said, um, yeah, I looked at the video. She said, uh, I bet you're quite guarded in relationships, aren't you? And I was like, oh my God, you know, who have you been talking to? 
And what she said is that she watched the video and she said, I was clinically good. She said, the, it was all kind of spot on, but it was like, I was thinking about the next slide or the next bit of content or what have you, you know, it, it was clinically good. And she said, what you need to be is not clinically good, but you know, she said, I'm, you're not showing me any passion, any of this stuff, you know, I'm not getting to know you. And she had me do some very simple exercises, you know, tell us, tell her a story and then tell her the same story like she was five years old and pointing out the difference. Um, I say, although I sort of intellectually got it, I think it took me about six months to really get it, that when you're on stage, it's not about telling somebody a clinically good story. It's almost like, you know, telling them the same as you would tell it when you're in the pub. And individuals hopefully then have, you know, almost have that one-on-one -on -one experience with you, as opposed to some clinical, you know, presentation behind a podium. So that was my kind of, that's always stood me in good stead, that being in the moment. And, and even when difficult events, you know, doing on Zoom, it's a nightmare, you know, you get no feedback loop, what have, what, what have you, you still got to be in the moment. You know, you, you might be playing a nightclub in Dundee on a Monday night, and there's five people there, but you still got to be you two at Wembley. Um, you know, you've got to go for it. Um, and then the other one, I guess, is a more recent longer term thing for me, this is probably more relevant to actual speakers rather than, uh, you know, the, I think the first one's probably the general presentation thing. But for speakers, oh, the thing I learned is about the tension between being an ex and an expert, that you, there's a brand management problem that when I started down this route, I positioned myself as an ex, an ex fighter pilot, it was the only card I had to play. And so that's the, the card I played, I played it pretty hard. And the slight limiting factor from that I made a rod for my own back is that I think I became known as an ex. Um, and of course, over time, I've been out of the Air Force longer than I'm in, I've done loads of other work, I've got two degrees, you know, I've done all this other stuff. Um, but it, it's been a challenging brand management exercise for me in sort of managing people's expectations about what I do. You know, I need to do a Madonna almost, you and I spoke about this, but you know, to reinvent, because I I'd sort of built quite a strong brand in a place that I sort of have moved on from a bit. So yeah, that's been a learning learning experience for me. Two great lessons. I quite like that, the ex and the expert. I like that. Justin, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much indeed. Thank you.